If nobody turned that one steer the four times you ran that night, you didn't get a turn in. <laughs> you just didn't get to row. When the heck loans you thirty thousand dollars to go rodeo? What are you talking? We get done. Like this sucks. We're still gonna do it. I I can't stand it. So I just go up to him and I, I am like, "Is there something wrong with your brain?" So we're officially hey, going. Unoffendable. You know, yeah, that that is our that really is our man. The name of the podcast is the Flatbed Podcast, and the reason for that is the Flatbed is like my habit. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, you just broke the record. That is the most pregame workout stretches by any guest so far. You have the record. <laughs> We've been listening to Goggins on the way over here. Dude, <laughs> we got to get hard. I feel like such a sissy every time I hear that guy. <laughs> Tough. We've been buds. I can't, I can't remember not knowing you. So I, yeah, to try yeah. to pick a day, like I just going back a long time and you are now, this makes me feel old. You're now headed to your 14th, 14th and a four. Yes, sir. 32 years old. I feel like I've known you forever. It's so cool. What you you kind of have on though. Yeah. I was around this, before there was tough. Yeah. You weren't around <laughs> before there was Jordan. <laughs> right. What, what year model are you? Uh, 82, 82, nice. yep. just turned 40 this year. Nice. Yep. That's crazy. Yes, sir. Crazy the years. How f- there's a saying that the days go slow, but the years go fast. And it <laughs> seems like that's true. Just became a dad. I did. Yes, sir. Just became a dad to a beautiful little girl. True fashion. Shout out Tiffany and true fashion. That's yes, a sir. great name for somebody that runs <laughs> fashion policy. That's a good name. Right. Uh, so I feel like, I feel like just because there's gonna be people listening, I, there's gotta be at least a few rodeo related questions. I know that that's gonna nice. be, that's, that's probably how people know you. But if I'm being honest, I feel like we could probably sit here and talk the rest of the day and rodeo not even come up. Um, you could probably do that with anybody though. Well, that, that might be true. I, f- I feel like, um, there's like 19 different places we can start. And I guess for those that would go like, I only know tough the rodeo and don't know who you are as a person. I want to say this before we start. I love who you are outside of the spotlight. When you, you it's like, you finally get to see like the <laughs> dial down who you are. It, the, who you are today reminds me a lot of who you were as a little kid. And I think nice. it would, I think it would be really interesting for people to know that version of you apart from lights, camera, action, tough for 6.4 seconds and rides out of <laughs> well thank you so much that's why you know i felt really comfortable coming on the show because it is so important to show your true authentic self and it's hard to do that whenever you're you know you're just your people see you for you know how fast you go in the inside the arena and yeah. that's what i love about what you have going on here it's so cool i mean wickenburg arizona you know sitting in a studio right now talking to you know some uh, essentially a brother that i have known my entire life about who knows what? So I'm excited. Thanks for having us here. So the challenge of a teen, because I've got my little boy is 14 years old right now. Yes, sir. And he'll come to me with some like deeply, deeply insightful questions. There's things he'll ask me that I'm like, dude, you're 14. Like that's <laughs> not, that's, you're not, you're not there yet. But then every now and then he'll make a mistake that also like makes him seem way younger than he, than he is also. Like there's this range of development. When you were 14, did you feel like that you were already starting to be locked in to who people expected you to be. Here's why I'm asking. And I know I've done all the talking so far, but here's why I'm asking. The challenge that you went through was that you had to grow up really, really fast, really, really early. And that comes with some huge challenges. So did you feel like that by 14 going to jets age that you were already starting to get locked into people's expectations of who you were supposed to be? Well, at the time, absolutely. But at the time I, I realized what opportunity that I had to, I saw the success in, you know, what would be that mold yeah. and I doubled down on it every day. You said and yes. You yeah, said absolutely. Yes, yes, sir. If it gave me more time to, if that gave me more time to practice and more opportunity to, you know, spend time in the arena, then, then that's what I was doing. Just you and the old paint against the world. <laughs> right. How much did you win that year at the U S finals? Uh, on the yellow horse, 19,000 enough to go buy the paint horse from Mitch Fechner. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yellow horse came from who? I remembered it one time. Who did the yellow horse come from? Uh, Dennis Hart. That's yeah. right. Yes, sir. You remember yeah. Dennis? Oh, yeah. Yes, sir. Dennis is the one that taught me to, if your horse unties himself, you can run the lead rope around the pipe and then tie it back underneath his chin. Taught me the same thing. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It's very important if he unties himself. Look, just tie it back to the halter. Yep. yep. Yeah. And then they can't, can't reach with the Yeah. <laughs> so they're... I mean, it, it, you're not really thinking about anything outside of rodeoing. I mean, that was it. That was it. The first year you cracked out, it was the, the three Cooper brothers getting driven around by Mike Arnold. <laughs> was it at that point? Are you thinking like, this is it? This is all I want in life. This is as far as 
you wanted to go or were you already in your mind? Cause I know where we're going today. Spoiler alert. I know that we're going to go into deeper stuff and I know, so I know that exists in your life already. Yes. Sir. At 18, where was, where was your head at being on the road for the first time going and doing it yourself? Oh, it was every dream. Every day I woke up, it was a dream. Get an opportunity to you go do all the things that you saw and learned as a kid. And it's the only thing, I, rodeo was the only thing I even knew anything about. It's all I wanted to know anything about. And so whenever I did turn 18, like, now it was time to start living. But when I say living, we're just, we're rodeoing. Right. And it was why most of my friends were going to, you know, prom or, you know, getting ready to do whatever they were doing that I later found out. You yeah. Know. <laughs> Stuff you hear about later. Yeah. Yes, sir. You know, I'm probably advancing into, you know, more of a rodeo role. And that's the only thing that I could even, you know, that was my heartbeat. That is so, to me, that is so full of opportunities for mistakes. And here's why. Because you are stepping out onto a very public stage. I look at Riley Webb this year. And like that kid in your story to me are very similar because yeah, oh yeah. people are like, here he comes, here he comes. You guys get ready. Here he comes. Yeah. First year out of the gate has a huge amount of success. But that comes with so many potentials for downfall because you are learning on a public stage <laughs> where your friends, like they're going to prom, but like nobody's yeah. watching their prom right. on TV. <laughs> nobody's like asking for autographs or interviews from a 17, 18 year old kid who's like, I don't know what I'm doing. Right. Yeah. If you're in a professional, um, space. If you're in a professional space, you're occupying a public space. I think there's this assumption you're supposed to get it right. Yeah. If a 17 year old kid made a dumb decision at a prom, people are like, oh, he's 18 years old. <laughs> you're, you know what I mean? So you're, you're sort of maturing or growing or becoming an adult with eyes all over. You're going, man, I just wanted to rodeo. I just wanted to go rope. But the world's saying, there's our next guy. He's wearing <laughs> Jesus on his collar. He must think the way that I think. He says Jesus, I say Jesus. He must believe the exact same things that I believe. And it's like, there's the, it's easy. I think it's easy to assign someone beliefs yeah. without ever finding out, without ever knowing if it's true or not. If what you say and in your life, as you're learning and you're in this process, yeah. might be 10,000 miles away from this person over here who's living a completely different story. Am I making sense? Yeah, but whenever I'm 18 at the time, I'm just, you know, a go-getter for the Lord. Yeah. You know, living, living my, living my life, like trying to do the best, the right that I know how to do. I was just really doing the best that I knew how to do. And right. it's hard to, uh, it, it that's hard. It, it becomes very difficult. Um, whenever you don't do any learning, whenever you don't do any growing. And that's probably one of the, one of the best things that I've learned lately is just how to keep doing the best that I'm, that I know how to do, but also evolve and learn through that process because I am given a great opportunity, um, with what I get to do in our small community, especially this very small care for open community yep. of, of what kind of, what, what am I doing that is benefiting not only me and, but the entire, our entire world. Yeah. And it is, one of the coolest things ever to see, you know, guys like Riley, another teenager mm -hmm. that, you know, I've known for since he's been three yeah. years old. Shout out Dirk Webb. <laughs> right. <laughs> that, but he's been able to do the same thing I was doing. And that was looking up to Strand and watching his career, looking up to, you know, any of the greats and anybody really in our whole industry of how can we continue to advance on what we want to do. And that's, you know, people like me and Riley, we want to rope calves. And, but we also <laughs> learn, we grew up in a church setting, and I learned who the Lord is at a young age. Who took you to church? Oh, I mean, you grew up in church. My mom, uh, there's actually like a, kind of like a family church that we grew up in, Tail Southside Baptist. Um, so it's like half my family, half another family. It's out in the <laughs> middle of, you know, a, a cotton field. Yeah. Um, so it's a, it's, it's a great, awesome, awesome setting we, setting yeah. that I grew up, grew up in. Um, so I asked you this on the way over here. By the way, for those of you guys don't know, Tough got to do Friendsgiving with us. E and, and TJ, everybody yeah. came by and hung out. Um, we got to talk about this on the way over here, and I actually loved your answer. So if you don't mind, I'm going to ask you again. You're 34 years old. 
you go back to 13 year old tough who's starting to have some success like the things that you're doing are working you're from a prominent family that has the ability to pave some roads some opportunities for you you go back and you see yourself at 13 years old and you sit yourself down just in this setting right here <laughs> what do you what do you tell yourself <laughs> honestly I, I probably i don't say a thing you know i would just think it would be the coolest thing ever just to listen to what you used to think at 13 yeah like let them absolutely deal talking. i mean i wouldn't i mean everything is perfect as is and it's very hard to live in that world but it's the only world that i have and so i continue to give my best for that each day and i wouldn't want to change anything you know the, the learnings have been perfect uh because what i'm so grateful for is being here sitting today talking to you with opportunity you know outside the door or whatever it is that we're talking about to influence in a positive way you know this world i think that coming from my background and given the things i've done in my life I've traveled through seasons where I'm like, I know what I would say. I would say, don't buy that horse. Or like, I know what I would say, don't buy that truck. Like all these things I thought would be really important. Like, oh, the lottery ticket yeah, numbers, yeah, right? Yeah. Like, man, if I, here's the numbers for this day or whatever. <laughs> and I think I'm back to that exactly what you just said of life is perfect. It's perfect because I didn't know. <laughs> right. It's the experiences that I would have avoided that now on the back yeah. end of those, I'm like, well, because of those struggles, God's got me in a place in my life that I'm genuinely happy. And I don't know that without those decisions or mistakes or all the chaos that I put myself through, I don't know how to get to where I'm at right now. And I think, I think that's, that's proof of the growth that you've done. I think I th that anybody would be able to, do, <laughs> to be able to go, I wouldn't change anything. I'm excited to be living today exactly like it is. And, and that's a struggle. It's not a struggle. It's, it's work that you, that I put in every day to get to that perspective. Yeah. And some days I'm, I'm not able to land on that perspective and, that's whenever my thoughts go in the wrong direction. And uh, if I'm lucky, you know, I'm around one of my good team members that lifts me back up, pushes you into the right direction. And that's what's so important to, for me, like to give my best is because I don't know when, at what point of, you know, the process or journey that I'm encouraging someone. It, is it the very bottom tipping point that brings them back up? Is it, yeah. is it you know, the, the fourth, you know, leg on the ladder that they – even if it's just a smile or an encouraging word, like I think we need to be there for each other so much, so much so, and encouraging each other to always, you know, give their best. I think, I think that for a lot of years, more than I even am proud to admit, I thought that people were around you as you were going for your goals. Like, right, you surround yourself with people to help you drive. And, like, there's the, you know, the rodeo world so famous for saying stupid stuff. Like, sit with the winners. The conversation is different. Like, you are accumulation of your five closest friends or all this. And so you want to only be friends with the winners and all this stupid stuff that we grew, we grew up learning. I yeah. learned this when I was a kid. And I'm really grateful to be at a place in my life right now where I'm like, no, the people are not to help you accomplish the goal. The people are the goal. The people are the end result. Like, yeah. that is the most important right. thing in my life is the people that are around me. Whatever goals I accomplish would be meaningless if it wasn't for the people that I had in my life already. So that's a, that's allowed, what that's allowed me to do is like take some losses, whether it's financial gain or like personal goals or whatever, to start sowing into and investing into the people that I have in my life. Not because of what they've achieved and how they could somehow benefit me, but because they're people and they're valuable and they're meaningful. And even if their opinions are different than mine, genuinely living in this life experience with people that are immeasurably valuable. And that's uh, to hear you say, like to surround yourself with people that can speak life into you. Yeah. I don't know how people live without community. <laughs> it is. It's one of the coolest. Um, I mean, to be honest though, sometimes I'll, I just, I don't mind going for a few months, you know, by myself completely just, yeah. but if you don't have that, if you haven't built that team that, and you're not all on at least, at least reading the same book, yeah. you know, of understanding of what life is understand, like the truth about right. life, then it's hard for someone to be able to help you, you know? I want to pivot here and then you decide like to what level of comfort you feel like. Um, I've got friends that are in a public space and they've got a lot of eyes on them 
and they don't want to profess Christianity. They don't want to talk about it. And I know that they love Jesus and I know that they're in the word and I know that it's important to them and it lands in a meaningful place in their life, but they don't want to talk about it. And the reason they don't want to talk about it is because they don't want to be lumped in with thoughts or groups. They don't want to be recruited into a club. They want the freedom to exist in the world with their beliefs and move freely amongst their social groups without being pigeonholed into you're on our, uh, you know, the pitchforks of like, we're angry, we're mad, we're, you know, the, the church has been responsible. I think like the Westboro Baptist Church, right? Like they're the worst of the worst of the worst that, that, that the church has to offer, which is like they picket uh, funerals of gay people and they picket the funerals of soldiers that come home dead from the war. And it's like, they say church, they're called Westboro Baptist Church, but they are just so vile and they're so flawed in their thinking. They're so broken in what they believe that I would, you don't want to be associated with them. Like yeah. there's no way to separate yourself enough from them because they're so flawed and they're so broken. You're in the middle of a season, and I think I'm in the middle of this season where we're wanting to know that we believe what we believe as we're as we're walking through this season, we're we're refining. Not that we're getting rid of, but refining what that means to believe in what we believe in. Do you feel like that you're in a free I don't know how to ask this? How free do you feel? to walk through a journey of discovery. And I know that's a, such a gross churchy thing to ask, but I just stepped back from ministry. I stepped back from a position in ministry. Yeah. And I want to know who Jesus is apart from my job in the ministry. You were 18 years old in a very public perspective with Jesus on your collar, and you're in a place where you're discovering a deeper understanding of who God is. Do you feel like that you haven't taken such a public stance in the beginning do you feel like that you're more drawn to being private in this season right now of walking through uh, this growth, this season of growth? Am I making sense? I feel like I rambled a lot. Uh, absolutely. Um, if I need to clarify that, you can ask me to clarify. I, I just, I, I feel like you understand what I'm saying. I understand what you're saying. You want to you make it, you want to clarify a simple question though? <laughs> okay. Clarify a simple question. That way I can answer it simply. Yeah. Because, go for I, it. No, go. I can. I can. I think that my concept of Jesus for a lot of years had church pews, hymnals, the communion cups, yeah, three songs, a sermon. Yes, sir. And that was about, truly, truly, that was about as far as my understanding went. There, to me, I, I would categorize Christians or, 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 or believers. This is probably even true in other cultures, Buddhist, Muslim. Every religion probably has some variation of this, where you've got like the office type personalities, yeah. people that have like an office job and they work yeah. inside all the time. And then people that are out in the field, people that just feel more drawn. Jacob and Esau was yeah. this way. Like you got the inside guy and then the outside guy. I've always felt like in my life, I'm more drawn to the outside version of my spiritual walk. Yeah. And so... Because the church model in America is so office model, that's the one we all know, church pews, the, the, the stuff that we think of when we think of that. Yes, sir. That any variation from that feels like a resistance to the church model. I know I'm spending like 35 minutes on this simple question. Stick with me, stick with me. Oh, yeah. Do you feel like you're finding your feet now in more of a field operational system rather than what we grew up believing being raised in the Tell Southside Baptist Church. Did I say that right? Uh, Tell Southside. Yeah. Shout out. Always. <laughs> Come see us. <laughs> I love it. Still my, still, still the best place in the world. If God's bringing you in your walk to a place that's more of a yeah. field operative versus yeah. an office manager, do you feel like you're finding your feet in that? It's opportunity of, for growth is probably my favorite thing in life. And, you know, being... A, in the spotlight of, you know, for 10 seconds, every once in a while, like I've used that platform for what I believe in. Now I would say you're, I would be in the uh, time of the book or the um, process that it's quiet yeah. and in quiet, the quietness, I feel like I'm, you know, can connect to God in a way that I didn't had I not been quiet. Right. And what that's, you know, showing me is that there's a lot of ways to serve God. 
there's a lot of ways, and you can serve God in multiple different ways at the same time. Um, there's a bigger picture going on with, and there's a lot of people out there that need that need help. They don't need the spotlight. They don't want the spotlight, and the spotlight is not going to show them true goodness. Yeah. And whenever you're finding those times in your quiet time, you know, God's showing you your mission, you're like, if you, if you accept it. Yeah. Yeah. And those are, the quiet times are probably the most, you know, difficult um, because you're searching. You're searching for a lot of stuff. Do you feel like in those times that are quiet, do, in the back of your mind, do you, do you feel this pressure? There's a lot of people wanting to know an answer and you're like, hold on, I don't, I'm working on it. Do you, does it feel like to you, there's a lot of eyes looking to you for like, okay, what, what are we doing? Well, I've learned to not give them a bullshit answer. Yeah. Yeah. Nowadays. Right. You know, I won't even, and I don't, I don't even like ever saying, I don't know. Don't like, I don't like even make getting to that point, you know, yeah. um, I'll let you know, or let's find somebody that does. Right. You know, we're not going to stop at that point right? in anything in life. You know, it doesn't, there's a wall up uh, around it, over it, through it. Yeah. You know, there's, or the other way, if you're listening. Right. Probably. Right. <laughs> if you're really listening, you don't have to go through your, every wall that gets put up sometimes walls, you're put up walls that don't need to be. I feel like, I feel like I can say this. I feel like I'm qualified to say this. I hope I am because having pastored a church for 10 years, I'm pretty, and then raised in a pastor's house. I'm familiar with how it works. I've been around a little, I'm 40 years old. I've been in the ministry for 41 years of that because my, before I was even born, this is all my family's done, right? Oh yeah. I think the church has allowed a little bit of a lynch, lynch mob mentality to develop a, a little bit. And I think we've got some restructuring to do in that. And here's what I mean. There's people that are at home in the office setting of the church. They love Sunday mornings. They love the pews. Oh, they yeah. love the hymnals. Yes, they sir. love the three songs. And that's home for them. So when someone says, I feel drawn to a different version, yeah. I feel like I'm on, you know, I, I, I'm walking through this process. I feel like God's filtering and I, I, like something different. I can't put my finger on it. I can't tell you what it is. I just can't tell you what it is. The people that feel like they're losing you from their group instantly, if they're not careful, will go, oh, he's lost his way. You know, as a kid, we'd call that term backsliding. Oh, you know, backsliding. Like, yeah. You're like, oh, <laughs> I've done a lot of backsliding. <laughs> and so I, you look I think, like a backslider. I think it's important. I think it's really important. Aren't we all backsliders, though? Well, well, <laughs> I, yes. But I think it's important that when we have the opportunity to go, wait, everybody just stop, put down your pitchforks, calm down. Yeah. <laughs> I'm figuring this out. God's doing something in my life. And even I had confidence in what was. Yeah, I can tell you how the church works. I can tell you everything about how the church works and what we're supposed to say and what we're supposed to do. Put your hand here. Go here. Do this. I, I got that. I got yeah. it. I got it. Yes, sir. Maybe I can't tell you with exact confidence what this is because I haven't gone through it before. And this is new to me. And yeah. instead of me walking on a path, I'm taking a hatchet to the jungle. I can only tell you what I'm experiencing today. Yes, sir. And I would love it. I would love it so much if people who call themselves believers had a little bit of grace in those moments to go, we're with you. Hey, yeah. and if it turns out, yeah. That that wasn't quite right. And tomorrow you want to come back and go, okay, I'm actually going to do it a little bit this way. <laughs> then instead of feeling like you're walking away from team Jesus yeah. to go on this journey of where God's taking you, that you got a support team of people that are like, this is how discovery happens. This is how growth happens. Dude. Yeah. I, I, I'm with you. If you're going through that, you know, it's something that you're, I agree 100%. It's, I, I had people genuinely <laughs> upset. They were stepping down as my role as pastor. And I'm like, you don't understand. It was killing me. It was killing me to show up to work every Sunday, feeling like I'm more of a field person. I'd rather go figure it out and get it wrong. I'd rather go try to learn it and get it wrong than show up every Sunday morning and do it right. I, I was, I've never been more dead in my whole life. Wow. And there's still people that will go, well, we're just really disappointed to see you leave the ministry. I'm like, do you not care about me at all? Yeah. Like, what about yeah. me? Yeah. What if, like, yeah. what if, what if God's doing something in my life that's going to break the doors open for other people outside of a church setting? That's way more exciting to me to, g even if it means getting it wrong Yep. for someone to go, wait a minute, I always struggled in the church setting. It was never very good there, but what you're doing, I get, let's go. We're actually, I, I really believe God will use people to open doors into new pathways of life and into new groups of people that were not being reached in a traditional method. 
But I think you have to be willing to face the rejection of the lynch mob that goes, well, then you've fallen away from the Lord. <laughs> That's something very few experience. It's, it's, I mean, nobody wants to be accused of falling away from the Lord because they're like, because you know what happens to those people. <laughs> Hell. And you're like, <laughs> calm down, dude. I'm just trying to figure it out. Like, <laughs> We're just throwing hell out there. Like, I'm just learning. Like, I'm trying to figure out what God's doing in my life. I just know it's not this anymore. And it's like, I, I, I wonder how many people would go like, tough. I didn't really get the Jesus on your collar thing when you were a kid because it was like, it felt like an image. And to any young person, any young person yeah. operates an image before they operate an identity. Yes, sir. Nobody steps straight into identity. You all go through image into identity. It's called persona. We yes, think sir. we might be. And so you go like, I think this is who I am. So here you go. World <laughs> numbers like, you better never change then because you already said it. You said it, you better stick with it. Hypocrite. Yeah. Hypocrite. And like, <laughs> incredibly difficult. Incredibly difficult to then come back and go, hold on. Everybody stop for a second. I think it might look a little different. I think there's actually a more accurate version of me. Let me work on that for a minute. Yeah. The courage that that takes because you know there's going to be people who are like, oh. Well, the the crazy thing is like the ones that see the most of it are your family or the ones that are closest to you. And that's like an opportunity itself, you know, to grow yeah. in all aspects because, and that's why it's so important to have that right team around you. But whenever in the case that you're alone, take the time, still take the time for growth would be my encouraging words is because it's a dark place is not fun. But if you continue to work through it and you really want to work through it, but you're searching and you want to search left and right, what I've found is that God is there with you and because he is in you. Yeah. And even though you are alone in those moments, it's you and him that pull yourself out of those. And you find what would be the truth then. And my favorite thing about it is once you do come out of the darkness – when you do fall back in it, you know that you've been there before. Yeah, you never quite fall as deep the next time. <laughs> yeah. You know your way around at yeah, least a little right. bit. And right. the cool thing is that whenever you do, you can you can start recognizing in just by expressions. You know, I have friends that know me. They can see me right in the box and tell what I'm about to do before I even do it just because of my tendencies. Mm -hmm. And it's cool that you – when you can recognize those tendencies of other people when they are in that dark spot, because that is when the helping hand or jump down in there, yeah. get shoulder to shoulder. That's hard to do. And that's what I learned whenever you're, when I, when you're there yeah. is to, that's the exciting thing. And I'm not scared. You're not scared of, to jump down in there. All of a sudden, the lows never are going to be yeah. quite as low ever again. Yeah. For the rest of your life, yeah. you're never going to experience a low the way that you did the first time. <laughs> right. And I think so many times people avoid it. They stay with the crowd. They stay with the group. They stay with image. They stay with what's expected because there's such a fear of the unknown. Yep. Like there's nothing more terrifying than the unknown. And so to have gone through that and go, wait, hold on, I survived. Yeah. I'm okay. Wait a minute. Then what is scary anymore? If I went through that, I thought that was the scariest thing in the world. Well, now, now what is there? Now there's freedom. <laughs> there's freedom because like what, what can do is harm. Yeah. Once you start letting that go, yeah. it is, it is such a freeing state. <laughs> well, so, and I, like, I really had, honestly, I really hadn't intended to talk about maybe this as much as I had expected, but that's one of the things about the story of Jesus touching the leper. It was symbolic. Yeah. It wasn't because he physically, because there were times that Jesus healed people and never touched them. The reason he healed the leper the way that he did when he physically touched him was because it was so anti-socially accepted because you know, it's, you're going to catch it. You're going to get it. You're going to get leprosy. And so this concept of Jesus touching the unclean and the unclean becoming clean, that's the opposite. We would think if something clean touches something dirty, the dirty gets on what's clean. Right. right? And Jesus does the opposite. 
And so what you're saying about in those moments, the understanding of who, who our creator to be is not a God that's going to sit on the finish line and go, I think you can do it. It's an involved, intimate, personal process. And I think when people understand like, that's really who, that's really the audience. Really, that's the audience. If there's a thousand people that are mad with pitchforks and say, I'm not doing Christianity right. If there's 10,000 people in the world that are saying that I'm a hypocrite because I'm not doing it the way that they wanted to do it, I don't have to like that, but it doesn't have to have control of my life because I'm, I am walking through this process with a creator that's as invested in my success as yeah. I am. Absolutely. And knows how to do it. Yeah. It's been there before. Been there before. And, yeah. and that's, I mean, anyway, is it, is it an assumption to say that the process is more valuable than the destination? <laughs> I, it, you've, I heard that my whole life, heard that quote my whole life. And you, I, couldn't even connect to it whenever I was younger. Yeah. Like, yeah. That's the stupidest, yeah, thing, this I've the stupidest thing I ever heard. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Now it's like, this is, wait a minute. What <laughs> the destination sounds cool, but like, this is the coolest thing yeah. right here. I'm talking to you. I'm on my way to Vegas to the NFR and, you know, sitting here talking to you in Wickenburg, Arizona right now is, yeah. this is as cool to me as I, I don't even know what we're doing next. You're not going to. I don't think now a person's we're ever going to have as much of an audience for process as they do outcome. I think there's a lot of people that'll wait for you at the finish line back. We'll say we always knew it was coming. We knew it. Oh man, this is going to be exciting. I think a person has to learn how to just walk in smaller circles when they love the process, when they learn to love the process. Cause it's easier maybe to like share, like you look at like take Instagram, everybody's showing fitness pictures of the final product. Nobody really wants to see the guy in the beginning. You know, it's kind of like, okay, we'll get there. When you get there, let me know. Right. Yeah. And and I think that that's an exciting place back to freedom again. I think that's exciting for a person to go like, no, I think it really is about today. I think today is the point. Yeah. I don't know where it's going. I can't tell people exactly where it's going. I just know today I'm living a life that is very different <laughs> than the, the chaos in the prison that I have lived in. <laughs> and that's your own mind. <laughs> <laughs> not yours, mine. <laughs> Say that again. Say that again. The, the prison the was prison, not the circumstances. Yeah, no, not the circumstances whatsoever. It's it's uh, the mind. I mean, it's what you want to create, how you perceive it, what your perspective is on it. You know, small circles, big checks. Yeah. Um, that's. <laughs> I think tough. I really, I with my whole heart, I believe this. I think this translates to a 13 year old kid sitting at home that doesn't know what he's going to do, doesn't know where he's going to go. Maybe his family doesn't have the opportunities or whatever the case may be. Uh, the old man that thinks he's at the end of his life and maybe didn't go the way he thought it wanted to, or maybe you know, he had success. I don't think there's any person listening to this that what you're talking about doesn't produce fruit. This concept of like living through the dark period, living through the quiet years. Jesus was here 33 years, 30 of those years were undocumented. We don't know what happened. Yeah. Think about that. Wow. Completely undocumented, completely in the quiet, completely in the shadows. Nobody, nobody knows that he was here for 33 years. Look at everything he did to change the world. And we only know about thir three years of it. Yeah. And the exciting part is not being the young, because I think any teenager would look at tough Cooper and be like, that's what I want. I want all the attention. Now I want to be in the limelight. I want to be known. I want to be known by the world. <laughs> I don't want to be, I don't want to be anonymous. I don't want to be you lost. Do, let me mentor you, please. Yeah. I'll do it for free. <laughs> but what you're saying is, hold on a minute. If you're living in the shadows, if you are living in the quiet years of your life, lean into that. There's life that develops in the shadows. There's growth that develops in the yeah. shadows without a limelight, without the attention. You're getting yes, to almost sir. do it later, which I, mean, I think there's a lot of people that don't do that. I think there's a lot of people like, sorry, I chose this path. That's just what I'm going to stay on. Well, it's, it's a every day. It's a, it's a, you got to re up. It's a new choice. It's a new decision to continue to do any, to go in any direction that you want to. If you want to get off that path, then I don't know. I feel like that opportunity is going to keep presenting itself until you ultimately do. Yeah. Or you don't. It's up to you. Right. And <coughs> yeah, it's, it's hard. It's a hard, it's a hard, it's hard to go left when everyone's going right. Um, Honestly, I think we're all, you know, just 
We're ma- way more uh, herd driven than we want to admit. We oh, so, oh, so y- yes, driven. sir. Yeah, it, it, just my mom. She'll just every once in a while, she'll just she'll just go bah, <laughs> you know. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, all right, all right. Okay, well timed. Seems <laughs> yeah, rude. Yeah, but okay, yeah. I got it. Yeah, yeah. That's all she has to say now. Um, but yeah, it's a. Uh, I mean, we're all we're all underdogs. We're all misfits. You know. Yeah. I'm not. I mean, have fun. Have fun. That's it. Well, but okay, but that's that. I want to go back. <laughs> not too because much if fun. You're not, well, no, but if you're <laughs> right, right. But if you're not right process time. minded, if you're only outcome minded, you will not give yourself permission to celebrate or let down or enjoy or be happy or laugh. No, that's all reserved for later. And it's like, hey, if you don't live it today, you can't save it up. Oh, like, hey. <laughs> your your ability to laugh or to be happy or to enjoy the people you're around that doesn't store up accumulatively for later. If you don't if you don't live in it now, it's not going to be there tomorrow. You're going to set patterns and habits of focus and no happy and no people and no joy and like you even if you get there, you're going to get there alone, and then it's not worth anything anyway. So what you're saying about live and be happy starts with the ability to live in the process and love in the process and go no, I'm I'm celebrating today for what today is with an eye on tomorrow too, but I'm not going to give today up. I'm not going to surrender today because I'm so focused on what's happening tomorrow. And, and the more I can, you know, buy into that, that I've put on there, it seems to make each moment better. You and me both. I suck at it. Listen, yeah. I, I want to be clear. I'm not good at it. I just, <laughs> I just, I believe it. I just believe it. I'm just not good at it. There's going to be somebody who said we didn't talk enough about rodeo. So I do have some real open questions. What are you riding this year? Um, rodeo questions, riding uh, riding just a lot of confidence. <laughs> <laughs> what horse are you going to ride yeah, this year? Um, what horse? I, a gray horse that I call bro. Uh, Cade Swore, shout out. Yeah, Cade, Cade, I bought him from Cade Swore. Um, he came from out here in Arizona, just a few miles really? away here. Yeah, the uh, K4 Ranch. Uh, Ricky Keffer and oh, yeah, Cade yeah, yeah. Are, are good friends. And Cade, uh, Cade got the horse from Rick and trained him up to be... You know, something that Let, has allowed me to, you know, take to Vegas for the f- last few years. And I bought him from Cade, so it's it's awesome, awesome to uh, have a great horse always. Okay, so let me ask you this: This is insider baseball, and you can say like safe safe word is Oklahoma if you don't want to answer it. That horse is as good as I maybe have ever seen. Start, run, stop. I've never seen him not pull when you get to the calf. <laughs> And it seems like his attention span sometimes. <laughs> right, it, maybe, yeah. Where, where are you at on that? Does it feel well, like he's... I think, uh, I think uh, one horses are a lot like their owners, so... Um, <laughs> but the funniest thing there is is the safe word is Oklahoma. I don't know if there's much safe... <laughs> very many things safe about Oklahoma. There's nothing safe in Oklahoma. <laughs> 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 That's always the Texas, Texas thing. You'll get it if you're from Texas. Um, on a horse yeah. like that, on a horse like that, he, is it just that he's so good everywhere else that you? I think because you win a lot, you win a lot yeah. on that horse. You, you're you're going to have your number one mount, and you you're going to continue to ride that horse if you believe that you know, you can continue to have success on him. I believe that horse is uh, something that I can have success at the highest level, and we're building on that every day, and we've been building on it for a few years, and um, it seems like it takes a few years to even figure one out to learn yeah, it. You right. know, the, the deeper you can go into a horse's career, and, you know, the, the better you should be getting. How long do you want a rodeo? Oh, Mike Johnson, forever and ever. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yes, sir. Never done. Yeah. I, I took a year off for the ERA a few years ago, yep. um, and what I realized is how awesome this is. Yep. And I, I changed my goals. It used to be youngest – to qualify, win championships, win them all, be done, figure it out from there. Now it's like, wait, this is cool. Um, Process not outcome. Yeah, again. yeah. Let's let's see what happens here. And then so, which is it's a good thing for me to have goals that I want to be able to perform and compete at a high level whenever I'm older in life because what it ha- what it has my mind attracted to now is is health and how I can make my body physically um, and better and how I can uh, learn how to get you know <clears throat> Joe told me the other day I actually have a torn quad right now because everybody that 
is always has an injury. He's going to talk Shout about out it. San Angelo. Yeah. Yeah. But Joe told me the other day, cause he's, I, I reached out to him because he's experienced injuries. And I, he said, look, every time I lost something physically, I had to make it up with my mentality or with, with the, the, I don't know, your, your mindset, I guess. Yeah. yeah. So with your wisdom, well, he did like, you look at the last yeah. couple of years, he made the finals. Yes, sir. Physically. You're like, yeah. How is that guy right in the top 15 in the entire world of calf ropers with some of the phenomenal athletes that rope calves? He was not moving around very good. And he just, he, his mistakes went down. He didn't make yeah. mistakes. He would never miss the barrier. He was doing things. Yet he clocked. So, I mean, yeah. he did it. Yes, sir. And that's, that's kind of, who knows what tomorrow brings. Um, I would like to continue to create, you know, this wonderful life that I get to live. But we'll see. There's a freedom in that, though, too. The, the, the precursor of, like, this is what I want to do. I want to rodeo forever. Yeah. But if that's not what happens, I want to go to whatever's next. There's a freedom in that. That's not a, that's not a cop-out. That's a freedom that says I'm not going to be owned by it. <laughs> I'm not going to give it all back when I'm done. I'm not going to be that guy that just beats my head against the wall because I can't do it anymore, but I'm too stubborn to move on to what's next. I, 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 I have grown into appreciating that statement of this is what I want to do, but we'll figure it out. <laughs> All right. Who? What's the best horse in the PRC right now? The best, the best calf horse, yours or someone else's. Like if you got to push a button and go, that horse belongs to Tough Cooper. What horse is it? Lord, hopefully the next one I'm creating. I don't. Uh, honestly, I, I. Is it hard to talk about? Because the minute you say it, the value goes up and your chances of getting bought goes down. <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm. Oh, I used to be. I'm not even involved in that. Oh, that's weird to even think about that. Wow, that's cool. I haven't even thought about that. I used to be so involved in that, like, because it's such a cool thing. Yeah. I don't know. I'm just so dialed in on what I have going on. Yeah. Like, I, do you like, I don't know. Do you like looking at what's next as far as the horses, or are you just happy with where you're at today? I mean, I, I, I know that you're taking the one you got. You, well, you got to be happy with where you're at yeah, today, and he's a yes, sir. good sucker. So I bought, I bought the gray horse two years ago for 250000 Great. Perfect. I don't, it doesn't matter to me. Right. Like it's a price is what you're paying, but it's the value of what you're getting. Right. And I always want to raise the bar and standards for our entire industry. Right. And whenever right. I have an opportunity to do that, why not bet on myself? Right. Absolutely. Right. So, well, and you can look at what your winning did the minute you got on him for somebody who hears that number. It's like, uh, yeah, what your winning right. did the minute you got on that horse was, it was instant. You didn't, you win the first round you rode him at the finals with at Arlington. The first night you got on him, didn't you win the round? I don't, I'm not sure. No, no. You really I didn't. don't I think know I the second. I think I won second that round. Yeah, I won but, second that round. But I, I mean, ended up was, winning around a few, a few rounds later. Yeah. Um, and each round is 27,000. That's yeah. a nine. Yes, yeah, sir. So yeah. for somebody that's trying to do the math in their head, like that's a lot yeah. of money. But if it's a, the difference between well, winning something or not winning something. Yeah. The, and the money is getting better in rodeo. So it's cool and it makes it possible, you know, yeah. but I leased a horse, you know, uh, for seven years prior to that, basically by paying mount money. And I would have paid the horse, you know, yeah, would have paid the horse back four or five, six times. Right. And it's, so that expense is already business. fixed regardless. Oh, yeah. That, that's, it's that a fixed is going to happen no matter what. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's fixed cost in, into, into what you're doing, but whenever you get on a horse and you can feel something that's special and you know, without a doubt, then yeah. bet on that. Right. And what I'm doing now is I have some uh, a, a superstar that I can build a team underneath. Right. And that's what we're right, doing right. now is we're getting and finding the best young horses that we can. And we're getting them to, you know, our trainers that are that are getting them broke the way, exactly the way you want them to. We're yep. starting with, you know, two-year-olds, three-year-olds, four-year-olds. We're trying to get a little bit of everything sure. to figure out, you know, by the time that – because calf horses take a little while to, to season. Sure. And – what has really allowed me to start this program also is the rope horse faturities that they're having. Sure. And uh, the team rope and our team rope are having a lot of success with that. And um, the calf rope is growing into that, you know, where you can actually start making money on a three year old, four year old, right. five year old, where you had zero chance to do that. Like you're not going to win a PRCA rodeo on a right. three year old or four year old. It seems like it seems like for a calf roping horse to get really, really good, they almost have to get bored with it a little bit. Yeah. They've almost got to be a little dull to it because, yeah. in my opinion, I'm, I'm curious if you agree or not. 
But for a calf horse to really, really work, it's not about what they do. It's about all the extra moves they take away. It's whatever <laughs> extra moves they don't have. Whatever is yeah. like the economy of motion, that's usually yeah. what makes the best calf horses. Yes, sir. So Cut to get corners. there, it takes a long time for a young horse to get bored with the lights and the sounds and all that. Yes, sir. More so than any other, that I think any other event, maybe a tripping horse, I guess. But um, So to have young horses coming up, it's a long-term investment. Explain it for people <laughs> that might, might be listening. Like yeah. Maybe that horse is going to be eight, eight or nine before he really gets good. What you're saying with faturities is there's a chance to compete against other horses that age they're allowing you to recoup some of what you've been putting into that yeah. horse before they're that, you know, seven, eight, nine years old, ready to go rodeo. Yeah, let's say you buy a, a, a yearling for, let's say, 10, 20,000, 15,000, and then you're going to put at least 10,000 a year in him. So by the time these five, six year old, you're going to have a minimum. Well, I'm going to have a minimum of, you know, 60,000 bucks in that horse, right. if not closer to 100, because. I would rather pay for something that is great and that's going to give me a chance at the end. Yeah. And so each year that we continue to invest money in it, then that's great. That's a great thing to always continue to invest into a, a horse that is advancing. If not, then the breakaway is becoming popular. The junior rodeos are, st junior rodeos are still happening good. And there, that's a great market to, you know, sell one of your horses that you, if you don't feel like is going to make it quite sure. for you on talent. So it's really important that you start with a horse that has the right mentality. It's that rising tide that floats all boats, right? Yes, like sir. when the tide goes up, all the boats go up. Seeing what's happening with the breakaway really matters to the calf ropers. There is a huge market for breakaway horses that didn't exist 10 years ago. And I don't, the shift is happening within right now. There's, I think there's a big shift happening within the last few months of what's happening with the breakaway horses and the breakaway horse market and the calf horse market. There's, it's going to, it's going to change to where that's 100% of the focus is how can we get a great breakaway horse? Isn't that awesome? It, it, it really is. It's cool to watch, watch calf rope and evolve. When I got here seven rope years ago to Wickenburg, you could go, I remember a girl saying you could go to like four or five breakaway ropes through the winter, something like that. Yeah. Every single day of the week now, you can find a breakaway rope. Oh, every wow. single day. It's growing, in, not just in the places where you think of rope and existing, like the Fort Worth area, you know, Fort Worth, Houston, traditional yeah. calf rope and areas. Yes, sir. It's growing. Everywhere. All over the country. Yeah. 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 And so to your point, with these young horses that you got coming up, if somebody goes, you know what, I just don't, he just doesn't pull the way that is beneficial for me to win something on him. There's 10 girls waiting in line looking they're, for that horse. They're, they're not even training them to pull now. They're they're because yeah. they're going to pay them before they get to that point. Right. The trainers right. are going to because well, our focus is on score run, right. drag your butt. Right. Who who is the best young calf roping horse trainer going right now? I know you're probably thinking about five or six different people that come to mind, but in your mind, who's doing the best job creating young? calf roping horses at that two three four year old oh yeah this is the answer that's gonna get you in trouble right <laughs> yeah because yeah. whoever you don't say much, thanks a lot tough yeah <laughs> it there's a lot of guys that put in so much work and it's so cool to see them just buy okay i get system. it that's really sweet yeah, yeah there's a lot of people we get it there's a lot of good ones i'm you asking name. you i want to name you who is right the now. best look one. shout out to my best friend since i've been day one Blake Deckard. He's my guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. From Oklahoma. Yep. He's. It's amazing to me how talented that guy is. And that there are people that don't know who he is. Because that kid is rank. That guy is a cowboy. And that's not, he's not just a household name. But he's a real one. Yeah. Yes, sir. He's, he's, he's awesome. Right now, today, I mean. That's your guy. I, I, I'll let him ride my good horse to a, a, a two-year-old you know, doesn't matter i i send my horses to his house i don't even tell him anything don't have to it's He'll actually it i'm getting in his way <laughs> yeah right if i tell him anything yeah yeah uh you said this you said that mundorf has calves this year yeah is this, uh, a, is this the first time he's had them dan dan mundorf had uh had the calves in 2017 and now uh dylan his son um they have the calves for the nfr this year and you said Hanchy said. I talked to Hanchy the other day. I didn't. I didn't uh, participate in the uh, in the preparation of the cattle. Like, well, the uh, torn quad. That's fair. <laughs> you can't show up, but <laughs> yeah. But Hanchy told me that there are seventy five calves going to Vegas, and every one of them are the same. That's so awesome. Yeah. What? Uh, 
Great. Si- I mean, size wise, what are, what are they compared to last few years? I I don't know. Hope they're hope they're. Uh, you didn't get too detailed. If you got to pick, would you rather rope bigger calves or smaller? I mean, not too big, you know, <laughs> like, well, being injured too, maybe that, yeah, would maybe like, I, I think what they've gentle, done, what's, any size, yeah, sir, gentle, what's happening now is cattle tie and you're not getting drawn out of it from, from a calf that doesn't tie. Yeah. And hanchi has been the director for a few years and it's been a buildup from, you know, what previous directors have put in the work Yeah. and you know, how smart Shane has gone about articulating, you know, what it is that we actually, you know, can control in our association, right. which isn't much, right? But right, Kev's taking a tie at the NFR. He's figured it out. Yeah. So, yeah, that's that's a cool thing. You know, kids keep going fast because cattle are tying. How much did it take to make the NFR this year? Uh, it took me 125. <laughs> I, I think wasn't 15th over 100,000. Probably so. Is that the first time? I I couldn't. That you tell can you. remember that? Yes, sir. I can't. I I mean that's yeah. that number just blows my mind. That you could have won ninety nine thousand dollars in the regular season, and you're watching it from home. Wow. Why is why is it all of a sudden there's so much money pooling at the top? Because they added Houston and Calgary back to the mix. I mean, honestly, there's rodeos that are getting better, yeah. but I mean, all the records. That's great. You know, everybody, congratulations. But that's what's supposed to be happening. Yeah. The record. Those our numbers on on dollars earned are not even close to what it should be paying. Yeah, no, right. Well, and like the big rodeos seem like they're getting better. Your average, like Thursday night What big rodeos them. are getting better? You've got now, you've got the American that didn't exist 10 years ago. Yeah. Uh, you've got Houston used to pay 50000 Did it pay fifty again? The big rodeos have stayed the same. The payout stays the same on those. Once you get, once those rodeos get to a certain point, they're covered. They're good. They're they're selling concert tickets. He, well, they're getting us there. Yeah, we're signed up. Yeah, yeah. It's those. It's the ones like what rodeo has to Idaho up? that that used to add five thousand and now they add ten. Right. There's more ten thousand added rodeos that you can go in. Forty five hundred dollars. Gotcha. That just, I mean, they're all over the map. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, which so is you're so cool the to bottom, see the bottom coming up, not yeah. the top. Going yeah, higher. yeah. The top ones, the top ones are obviously no the ones you want to no go. One's turn those yeah, out. yeah. You, I'll be there. You, you know, <laughs> right, right. God willing. Right. Like, but it's so cool to see all those, all the other ones step up. I know you're entered, and so this is an awkward question because I'm asking you to talk about people you're roping against. It would be different if you were, like, retired and looking back on it, but I'm going to ask you anyway. Who do you look at this week going into the NFR and think, man, that guy's about to have a really good week? <laughs> you, you, we'll put you on the list. Other than you, in your mind, who's the guy that stands out? I was like, man, that guy's peaking at the right time. I don't know. I, I would I haven't thought about that, but probably Stetson Wright. <laughs> <laughs> I meant the calf rope. Oh. St- world's safest bet. Stetson, you know, I think, I, I mean, I don't know. I don't want to go too far on a limb here, but I think Stetson might might have a good, other than in the calf rope. And yeah, you've been, if you, you haven't, San Angelo, I guess, is a jackpot kind of. It's bet. been a strange year for me. I am usually keep up and stay dialed in on, you know, like, what kind of underwear you're, my competition right. you know, are wearing. But this year, having a, a child, our first child, I really wanted to be present and, spend so much time with yeah. my wife on the growth and of you know of our baby i went to like 30 like seven rodeos ended up competing at like 37 rodeos coolest like hold coolest on. year ever. hold on i don't know that i knew this well you the rodeo it's not count, like a no, no, big no, no, deal no, no, it is let me let me just say, i know you're not supposed to say that it is i get it i can say that's a huge deal because the rodeo counts what 75 this yeah 75 yeah. you could have gone to 75 i probably entered 75 <laughs> <laughs> Competed at 37 rodeos, made the national finals going in, what? Seventh. Yeah. That's that's an incredible year. See, that's the cool thing about rodeo now. Like, it gives you an opportunity to do that where prior, 10 years ago, you yeah. you got to get your numbers. Right. You know, pretty close to. Well, how many did Brent Lewis go to that year when he almost, because he was having, his daughter was having some health stuff. Do you oh. remember this? No. You'd have, you'd have been yeah. younger. You'd have yeah, been there was a year that Brent yeah. got in with just like astronomically low number of rodeos, but it wasn't thirty seven. It was more than that. Yeah. Well. So you. But, got, but that's what I'm saying. They're paying better now. Yeah. Like San Angelo's paying. You can win twenty thousand 
at yeah. a lot of these big rodeos. But that allows, like I said, that allows you to have a family and a life and be home and not really have to pay attention to what everybody else is doing. I mean, you got to win. You got to show up. Okay, you better okay. win. So you, you went to 37 win. rodeos. Do you think there's going to be people who get out there and they're like, you're here? We haven't seen you all year. You made the finals this year. Like, where have you been all year? You're the guy that, like, it's like you got invited because they didn't see you at half the rodeos of the year. Yeah. Well, with how much money it's in Vegas now, it, it doesn't matter. You get in and you got it. It does not matter. Yeah. You know, I've the, the number seventh position going dri- like driving out here, no pressure. Yeah. You know, you're drafting off the leaders. You're ready to, <laughs> yeah. ready yeah. to pass. I don't them. have a target on my back. Uh-huh. They don't even know I exist. Hopefully they don't. Yeah. No, I guarantee <laughs> they do. But, um, <laughs> 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 yeah, no, I promise you, you're not going to sneak up on anybody. <laughs> What's that nasty thing? <laughs> he, he's laughing. We're, I'm, a, I'm, I'm like one of the biggest fans of of Bryce Thug Nasty Mitchell. He's he's an Arkansas MMA fighter, and and he uh, he said he, he said that um, I come like the dark of the night or something. But <laughs> is a pro- I don't I don't know I. The point is, you being you, you're not going to sneak up on anybody. I mean, I think going in seventh, yeah, I don't think right. there's anybody yeah. that's counted you out at that. So, man, you're headed to Vegas tonight. Thank you for stopping in. Like, I, thanks for hanging out with us today. Always a pleasure to get to talk to you. I'm so, I'm so selfishly proud of this process that you're in. Just seeing the the development. That's like, hey, taking a step back and being a dad, being a husband, living the life that you're living without the outcome of like, I'm just living today for today. I think there's going to, I suspect there will be people who listen to that and they're like, no kidding. Cause that's more like me. I didn't understand a kid being in the spotlight, having success. Yeah. that I didn't really connect to like, ah, okay, cool. But I don't really get that. This, this is something I think that is a, it was a, a necessary thing. I felt like it's important. What we, I, I felt like what we did is important. So uh, your work here is absolutely wonderful. I'm so you know grateful to be a small part of small part of what you got going on. Hopefully, uh, Hopefully this message is received well. You know, if not, we'll redo it. Yeah, I'm not worried about it if it's not. I think there's gonna be a lot of people like, man, finally, finally, a tough that I can understand. I think it's great. I, I'm, I'm, I'm in. I'm, I'm yeah. sold. Yes, sir. Super excited. So, good luck out there this week. Uh, we'll do it again. Jordan Weaver, thanks for having me. Later Thank on, you, fellas. You're welcome. Thanks for having us.